Hello and welcome to Office Hours. If you're getting here from YouTube, you can find out about what we do at officehours.global. There you can fill in a question and be a producer of the show and ask our questions. So you get to fuel just where we go uh, on this journey today. We have our education hour later and we're rounding out our week of brainstorming. So we're asking you what topics we should consider for the next few months. So stick around for our second hour as we talk about that. Uh, let's go to our first question. Thank you, Josh Mann. Uh, Mitch Hill with a question from Paul, whoops, uh, from Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. How does the Ultimat keys differ in visual quality from the advanced keyer built into the A10 Mini Extreme ISO? What would be the difference for educational programs using green screens? Go ahead, Mark. So I'm not an expert in this, but I do have an Ultimat, and the Ultimat is where you bring the camera into first before you would bring it into the switcher. It offers you a lot more control, so you can make uh, very subtle adjustments in different uh, types of this key that you're doing, and it also frees up keys that would be on the ATEM switcher. Thanks, Mark. Mitchell. Yeah, uh, Mark is exactly right. I mean, for those of us that spent Many, many thousands of dollars on the original Ultimat. Uh, back in the day, it was like thirty or forty thousand dollars just to have one. It was a hardware device. Uh, this is a real pleasure. They have uh, three in their product line. Uh, the middle one uh, will do uh, pretty much what we needed to do, and it is far better than what the ATEM can uh, generate. With uh, with any kind of keen device, it's really all about what it does with your hair and your background, how it's able to clean up the green screen. There's no green screen is perfect, but it gives you a lot more latitude in terms of catching a key. And uh, I guarantee you it will, it will outperform the ATEM version built in any day of the week. I see the uh, advertisement on the tin is that um, color separation and spill suppression too. So interesting. I wonder if it's something that can get you closer to, um, to a green screen. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Well, one of the things the Ultimate does really well, and as Mark said, the fine tuning is really accurate and gives you lots of latitude. But one of the things it does better than most is, is leave shadows in. You can have a shadow in your green screen and it'll appear through the mat. So as a mat rather than a key, it works much better. And I haven't used the A10 one, so I can't compare whether it does shadow better. Interesting. Yeah, I know we've had some reports uh, on it from some of the folks in, in After Hours, and the comparison was that uh, it was worth <laughs> it's worth the money if it's something that you do on a regular basis. And I know we mentioned somewhat about the different product line they have, the Mini and the 12 and the 4K. I'm not sure about the feature set, too, that might be different depending on uh, scaling up, but um, it looks like at least capacity. Gives you a little extra capacity there. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you could create a um, um, a virtual background with keys because it can take multiple inputs on the high end 4K version of Ultimate. So that's kind of neat. Oh, fantastic! All right, let's go to our next question. From Clive Kitchener from Sook, British Columbia, Canada. Is there a specific episode of Office Hours I can send media relations people that shows to them what they should be aiming for when it comes to audio and video quality? A ruthless review, perhaps. Hmm. Go ahead, John. I would say that any episode of Office Hours would be appropriate. And I would actually discourage you from sending them to a ruthless review because it's so inside baseball sometimes. Um, maybe some of the times we've talked about setups in general, like the equipment people have, might be better for somebody who maybe doesn't have the same technical background that we talk about on the Ruthless Reviews. John Preto. I, I would say Alex is, is super sensitive about this kind of thing. I would reach out to him on Discord and get clearance before you send it out to anybody. Go ahead, Mitchell. We do a lot of great second hour demonstrations, and I think most recently the one that caught my attention as being quite good. Uh, was the Sony FR7, uh, their new pan tilt uh, camera that can uh, make a lot of moves and looks great. It's about $10,000. Uh, I think that the review that we did was as good as anything that's out there on the internet. I don't think there are a lot of reviews on it. So um, I would be inclined to send that off to the Sony folks and uh, try to leverage that into perhaps uh, some free stuff. 
Yeah, and I think um, when it comes to quality, consistency should at least get a mark uh, beyond hitting a higher mark. I mean, sure, there might be a particular episode that might be uh, pretty uh, impressive, but I would say the next episode, uh, tune in any episode, having to be able to maintain the quality and uh, being able to guarantee it, I think definitely says something uh, more about than just having a, a good setup for a particular time. If um, if it's a high mar- high market that we're talking about, and yeah, the the inside baseball of the uh, the ruthless reviews is something that uh, might be helpful to to give people the idea about what criteria we're looking for and you know how we're how we're analyzing things to be able to maintain that quality. But um, it is it is um it it is a, a, a sort of a um, uh, an extra burden that that you have because once we raise the quality bar, then um, you know any anything below that bar tends to stick out a little bit more. So it, it's it, we tend to be a bit uh, self governing here as far as you know audio and video quality. Uh, go ahead, Dave. I guess I'd vote a little bit for ruthless reviews because they explain the cost of what they're doing, uh, the sort of devices that they put in the audio chain, or. How, wh- why they chose a certain camera and what their, you know, distance from background is and all the things that are subtle. And just as, you know, Josh, you have that background that you can change and, and have as a, a different color. Uh, other people just have a sort of background like mine, which is all real stuff. And uh, some of that is that nobody can see the audio treatment that most of us have done because it's all off camera or behind the screen. And so the Ruthless Review would give a, a media relations person an idea of what's involved in getting it to look better and sound better rather than just using it as a, this is high quality stuff. That's true. We we do um, a, a few uh, Ruthless Reviews. We, we do usually, we'll do one typically that focuses just on the audio. Uh, and then we'll have one that focuses on the video. And we've also been doing a behind the scenes, which, you know, what may seem like a pedestrian, you know, land, uh, backdrop here. You might be surprised, you know. About well, recently we did, you know, um, low cost setups, and people were showing that they had very simple setups and very little uh, equipment to make it look good and sound good. Yeah, it just came up in. Um, uh, I mentioned for a client um, that my my back my background um, setup was probably about $50 on Facebook marketplace, you know, so you don't need a lot of, a lot of money, uh, to be able to, to have something that's presentable. Although knowing how to present it and using the lighting, um, does, uh, make arranging things helpful, especially if you're used to helping on clients look good. You can usually triage a situation and be like, Oh, well, can you get some, some books and lift up your camera a little bit? Cause we're looking down a little bit on you. So, uh, you know, being able to to uh, make do with what you have uh, is more more a talent and a skill which we can learn, um, and so it's something that we learn from from being here on the show. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you know, why stop at audio and video? Let's uh, move on to the clothing. Whether you have a bad hair day like I've got, what kind of hat you're wearing, I think uh, all of that should be fair game. Yeah, um, I don't think we'll have any runways anytime soon. But um, you know, as far as our 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 visuals, our audio, and our different setups, I think I think we've pretty much got them covered. And typically, we'll do those about around once a quarter. Uh, they'll come around. So uh, if we have any other ideas about things we can be ruthless with, uh, we were talking yeah. about doing one uh, ruthless review of what's in your rack. That would be fun. Nice. What's in your rack? <laughs> or uh, what's the um uh what's the the gaffer rack i have a gaffer rack uh so i could show you what's in my gaffer rack <laughs> that's a uh, a rack that you secure with gaffer tape uh let's go to our next question next question in from morgan price uh also in british columbia victoria for a three camera video podcast setup what cameras would you recommend and why? Two hosts and maybe a guest on site. Assume acoustic treatment and lighting are all okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Jesse. 
I would recommend the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K cameras, especially if you're running into an ATEM. A lot of love here for the 6Ks, but when you're doing a podcast where you just want to set it and forget it, you want that smaller sensor size because you will have a deeper depth of field, which allows your host and guests to move around a little bit more before they fall out of that zone of focus. And if you are going into an ATEM, go for the ISO, whether it's the extreme or the base model, the, the ISO functionality is, I would describe it as essential if you're uh, doing a podcast, a video podcast. Go ahead, John. Jesse's got some really great suggestions. I'll just add to it that no matter what camera you decide to go with in the end, it's going to be easier for your production if they're all the same make and model. Uh, because you don't have to balance the colors. They're all going to be more or less in the same range, and that's going to really simplify your uh, your production. I would personally use a 6K. I have a 6K Pro. I would supplement that with 6K cameras because they all have more or less the same technology in there so that they would balance out. But Jesse's got a good point about the sensor size. Mitchell. Yeah, I like John's suggestion about having three of the same. And if I can take three and there's no budget, I'm going to go to the aforementioned Sony FR7 because uh, you can control them remotely, uh, color correct them. I think you can do that with a panel, but uh, it would be, I think an award should be given to the first person to use three of them. Mark? Well, if that's, that's no budget. But if you have a budget and you uh, want to use a micro four thirds lens, uh, then this is a great camera right here. It's controllable by an ATEM. If you have more of a budget, you could go to the full frame uh, 6K camera. And then if you really have uh, an unlimited budget, you could move up to the Ursa Mini Pro 12K. That would get you an award for sure. Jesse? Uh, just a quick jump in. I'm pretty sure the 6Ks are super 35, not full frame. Thank you for the correction. I think you're. I think you're right about that. Thanks, Jesse. All right. So uh, Morgan, hopefully, giving you something to think about. Let's go to our next question. Graham Cardwell from Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, asks a question. I'll be taking a spare iPhone as an extra camera on a trip. How do I clear its onboard memory to give me more local capacity without losing stuff from my cloud account? Should I set up a different Apple ID for it, or is there a better, simpler way? Dave. There's two things I did when I recently took a trip and spent three weeks shooting with my camera. One is that Apple has a, a way of offloading apps without losing your settings or any of your data. And you can gain a whole lot of capacity in your memory temporarily if you don't have to use those apps during your travels. So uh, uh, certainly your email or your messaging stuff is going to be there. But any of the games you have, any of the big apps for other uses and and other heavyweight apps, uh, you could take those and take them off temporarily, and it won't lose much. Uh, that's kind of like thinning out your your base uh, levels. And certainly, photos um, and uh, apps are the two biggest things. Usually, taking up space on your phone. The other thing I did was I offloaded all my available stuff from my phone before I left, put it to my laptop and didn't connect it to iCloud. So I used a non-connected off, I just wired it in and pushed everything off. And then I had all the space I needed for videos and photos. And I shot a lot of videos and uh, didn't even use half of my uh, my uh, data size for my, uh, my phone is a 256. So I shot a lot of video, I shot a lot of pictures and I had plenty of room left over. When I got back, I th did the same thing again. I pulled them all off the phone and then I put the phone back on my iCloud to resynchronize with everything that was there. So I captured all my stuff and kept it offline and then went back to my online stuff and, and resynchronized it. I'm actually having the same um, issue where I'm getting the uh, space warning. And Dave, uh, you mentioned that there was a good way to do that. Would you just uninstall the apps that you weren't using? Uh, you don't uninstall them. You just sort of remove them temporarily. There's two... Uh, there's delete the app and the data, and then one is delete the app with remaining the data so that you can reload it on again. Uh, it's in the iCloud settings, uh, in, in the controls of, it shows all the apps you have, and then you can say, I want to take this app offline, 
and then it keeps and it, the dialog box says it'll keep the data for you when you want to put it back on. Um, the other thing about having a laptop that's not connected to iCloud is it becomes a permanent storage. You can put it on an offline hard drive or an external uh, USB stick and that sort of stuff. And then when you want to resync all that with iCloud, they all merge together. All right, fantastic. We'll have to look into that. Yeah, and the other warning is that, yeah, your iCloud account, of course, has to be big enough to take both of what you already have and what you're going to bring back from your holiday. So you might find you reach your limit just when it resynchronizes, you'll get that warning that says you run out of space on iCloud. Do you want to buy more? And supposing that you don't want to buy more. Then you got to offload options? things. Yeah. <laughs> take all that stuff from uh, 15 years ago and park it on a hard drive or a USB stick. Yeah, I'm thinking that the video is probably going to be the worst offenders. Uh, after that, probably large apps and then photos, mm -hmm. depending on their number, as far as my hit list. So if you have three podcasting apps or three camera apps, you got to pick the one you want and then offload the others. All right, let's go to our next question. David Brady, New York, New York, asking, using Zoom's method of streaming using OneTouch Go Live on Facebook dies after five minutes, yet using stream key in a hardware encoder is fine. What will be the root cause of this behavior? And um, that might be a good uh, option to send into to our support. Um, the the features that have been around for a while, um, probably from from version to version, you might look at um, you know backing off a version if you're having difficulty with a with a new one. If we're not looking at a new version, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, and using a hardware encoder means that you're skipping some software somewhere that would otherwise be doing that. So apparently, there's something wrong with the software uh, between Zoom and Facebook that uh, not allowing that to work. Go ahead, John. David knows we when we do Nerd World podcast, I use the one touch method to podcast up to Facebook, and we usually go for an hour, maybe two. Sometimes never had a problem. Hmm. Well, John, you got to go longer than five minutes. See, there's your problem. All right, let's go to our next question. Jesse Kester from Glendale, California. Plugging a pocket cinema camera into the A10 doesn't reset the white balance, but opening the software does. Is there any way to stop this? I've tried save and save startup state, but um, what am I missing? Hmm, I see. Um, go ahead, John Snyder. What I, I'm wondering if that's intentional because they you can have multiple pieces of software controlling the camera and they just do a reset anytime you open a new piece of software to make sure that you don't have conflicts between multiple controls. I don't know if that's the case, but that'd be my guess. Mitchell? I'd also took a look, uh, take a look at the XML file in the startup folder for uh, the ATEM. Um, and if you're having problems with that, toss it out and see it rebuild and see if that uh, fixes the problem for you. There might be some something going on in there that's causing an issue. And Dave. I guess I would recommend that uh, Jesse go into After Hours and see if someone there can walk him through uh, what's going on with that camera and see if it's consistent with other people. Jesse? The other thing is it's only once per startup si cycle. So if we turn the power off, if we unplug the ATEM and plug it back in, the next time we open the software, it will reset color balance. But I can, once it's done that once, I can close and open the software as many times as I want, and it does not reset the color balance. Go ahead, Mitchell. Jesse, is this like uh, the problem people have reported where uh, their color balance settings uh, don't come back after they uh, restart, um, and they have to jiggle the uh, one of the settings in order to get it to remember? That I don't know. I, I don't know about that one. So is that a matter of just uh, toggling a particular setting to get that to take, Mitchell? That's what I, I've heard. I mean, again, I don't do it. I don't have a Blackmagic Cinema camera, so I can't test that. But uh, people have uh, reported that issue before, at least in that sense. I'm not sure that it relates to this white balance, but could be. All right. Let's go to our next question. Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C., and right here on our panel asked, given issues around using cloud password storage, how does one track hundreds of passwords? 
I think we need an answer from John. My suggestion would be to, if you're in the Apple ecosystem exclusively, just use Apple's built-in password manager. It's actually gotten really good over the last three to five years. If not, you can always have the option of not remembering your passwords and doing a password reset link every time you use a service. <laughs> Let's see what John has to say. About <laughs> so um, I've been using one password for however long they've been out there because it started on a Mac as a Mac application. And then, I don't know, four years ago or so, they moved it to the web. Uh, super comfortable with 1Password. Uh, but I'm waiting for pass keys to come out so we don't have to worry about passwords anymore. John? Well, this is kind of my bread and butter. I work in cybersecurity and, you know, deal with password managers at, at work a lot. Um, I am switched over to Bitwarden. Uh, what I like about it is it's open source, which means that people can look at the code, people can evaluate it. You can host your own vault or you can subscribe to the Bitwarden and use them to uh, upload and manage your vault across devices. That's what I've chosen to do because I do like the convenience of the cloud. I understand it is slightly less secure uh, or technically significantly less secure, but I'm not a big target. So I don't think it uh, matters for me personally. Uh, you're going to have to look at your own threat model and evaluate the risk for you. If it's a personal and you're not doing, say, a lot of overseas travel to China, then you're probably okay. If you are going overseas, I had a friend that actually <laughs> was uh, a weapon inspector uh, back in the uh, 2000s. And his threat model was significantly higher. So, you know, do what's right for you. And John, uh, would you say that Bit Defender, um, Bitwarden rather, sorry, has a, a good uh, mobile uh, support? So far, it seems to be okay. Um, the only feature it's lacking that LastPass had is LastPass had the ability to store uh, second factor token generators. Uh, like the Google Authenticator in the cloud. And I really like that because whenever I changed phones, uh, which I've done four or five times since I started using it, uh, I didn't have to reset my second factor and it would migrate over. Now I've got 20 or 30 second factors that I have to reset in the next week. But yeah, that's what I would uh, would recommend is I like Bitdefender. One password is good. There are others uh, that have, you know, been highly recommended by others, but uh, use what's right for you. But Thank do you, use a password. I'm going to say, just to wrap up, do use a password manager. Don't rely on your brain. Your brain isn't good enough to have truly complicated passwords. Just remember the one. Go ahead, Jesse. Um, I... <laughs> I've off, I've often gone with the use my brain. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I, I thought that you know, fourteen characters plus with uh, random strings inside there and something that you know reliably was good enough. Can it seems like the panel is pretty much unanimous across the board that a password manager is the way to go. Um, can we can we just jump into that for a sentence or two of of why my brain ain't good enough? Well, you will need your brain to remember at least one password, even with a password manager. Go ahead, Dave. Well, I, I'm actually um, in tune with John Preto here because I was a 1Password user right when it came out, and it served me really well. And the difficulty is for me is I don't want to store things in the cloud. And 1Password is moving us to the subscription model, which will eliminate the – they'll use a – an electron app or something and not a, an actual Mac app anymore. So uh, I guess my uh, my follow-up to this is a bit like Jesse is, is what's your use case? I don't manage for anybody else. I just manage for work that I do in my company. And I don't have a whole room full of people usually. And so I don't have to handle other people's passwords and hand them out or monitor them or, or administrate passwords. Uh, what I do have, the, however, is probably half of the 120 passwords that are in my 1Password, I don't even know what they are. 
They were generated by 1Password, used for that link, and uh, they continue to be used. And anytime I want to change the password, it's a piece of cake. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, actually, maybe for Mark's benefit, is being in the cloud better? That is, accessing your, your passwords in the cloud is somehow easy, making life easier than just having it on whatever devices you're using. That's a good question. John, uh, do it. So to go back to um, Jesse first, the reason why your memory isn't good enough is that you're going to, you're going to be reusing passwords more often. And every single site needs its own unique password. Now, if you're able to manage 100 sites and keep them all going while using the, the, that your password strategy, fine, that works. Most people can't. And so I'm talking in general for most people, lowest common denominator, because that's what I have to address with uh, at, at the office. I got 20,000 users. I have to make sure that they all have a way to save passwords. Uh, the actual best way to do it is, you know, if you want to be ultimately secure is to write them down on a piece of paper and put them in a safe somewhere and then go to the safe when you need them. Uh, no electronic copies. But barring that, then you want to use a password vault. Cloud versus uh, local, I prefer cloud because it's much more convenient. It means that whenever I change a password on my phone, it shows up and syncs to my desktop. I have five desktops. I have two iPads. And, an iPhone, and two iPhones. I have a lot of different devices. I need to have them all synced. Not everybody does. And if you just have one phone and one computer or just one phone, then maybe you don't need a cloud-based solution. But if you've got a family and you want to share the Netflix password, at least for a little while, with the family, um, then you're going to need a cloud-based solution so that all the family get access. If you're going to, uh, I mean, whether that be Apple, whether that be one uh, password, whether that be, you know, uh, Bitwarden, it's what, you know, you find the one that works for you, find the one that works for your family and use that. Jesse. Uh, thank you for addressing my question, John. I do appreciate that. And I think one of the ways that we can improve this conversation about passwords moving forward, at least in the office hours environment, is to be more clear in our delineation of is, if we're talking about personal use passwords or for business passwords or employee passwords for business, because each one of those feels like it's an entirely different conversation. You know what uh, washer, dryer, and computer all have in common? They all used to be occupations and now they're machines. So if you want to go old school, you could have a password manager that's a password manager. Mark? I think Jesse makes a good point. It does depend how you're using them. And in my particular case for a business, you just sometimes have to share passwords with IT guys and things like that, IT people. And so it makes it easier to use something that is sending an encrypted message back and forth rather than sending passwords in the email or messaging them. So I think that the cloud service offers some benefits and I don't want to carry a safe around with me everywhere I go. I know um, most of my devices all have Google on them. I've been using Google's password, built-in password manager, and I don't know how, I've never used a, a different one, so I don't know how it might stack up to Apple's or, um, you know, one of the other um, applications built in, but using a password manager, um, I could definitely see that as one of the, one of the things that um, that you'd want to do. I I think the the old way of thinking was that having um, uh, if if you have to type some, uh, not all passwords need the same level of security. Um, some accounts that I have are secondary accounts or sort of throwaway accounts. Um, if I type in even if I have a password manager, having to copy or visually copy and enter in text from a long chain of, of string of characters that I can't put in my head will put me off of using it and may result in less secure behavior if I were to 
to try and uh, buckle down on that. So I think it's triaging what uh, particular passwords uh, you know need the, the heavier treatment and which ones that'll cause you more difficulty to look them up is is helpful as opposed to you know hitting it hitting all with the uh, you know the 14, 15 character uh, you know unrecognizable versions of it. Let's go to our next question. Bob Sturdivan in San Antonio, Texas asks, NVIDIA Maxine had been released earlier this year, but I only just saw it. AI shows you looking at the camera. Would like to hear the panel's opinion. It does mouth move and also for different languages. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, we were talking about it on After Hours the other day, and uh, Bob was telling me that you could turn your head all the way to the side and the AI would continue to have your face facing the camera with your eyes and your mouth and still look uh, rather uh, rather real, I guess is what he was saying. I used to have to do that for clients where I had to change where their eyes were looking or other stuff, and I used uh, Mocha to make that happen, but I've never heard of a real-time solution. So this is, uh, this is very interesting, and I'm sure that if we could go back in a time machine, Clutch Gargo would greatly appreciate it. Nice. I was looking at... Uh before and after shot as far as this is a still frame as opposed to a uh, you know single shot I has anyone been in a meeting with with that enabled or knew that it was enabled I think didn't Apple do that uh, at some point uh, was was trying to to do the eye the eye contact thing um, I, I do a lot of work with clients that I you have to keep coaching to <laughs> to make eye contact and i don't know if um solving the problem by moving their eyes in a different place or actually having them make that that eye contact would be something that would that would have the same uh so have the same impact yeah it's a but tracking it, it's a tracking issue if you're going to do it manually go ahead dave yeah, I'm just going to comment on the Apple uh, center stage thing um, that in the new iPads and and probably in the next Mac uh, books, uh, it's uh, using a larger sensor and then it allows you to crop and track and follow sort of pan and scan. Um, they also in the more recent uh, iPad pros uh, move the camera to the side. So now in a horizontal mo uh, mode, the camera is at the top and you're not looking off over to the side. And, and looking at your monitor instead of the camera. Yeah, I thought um, I thought one of the companies, I don't know if it was Apple or not, one of them actually had the thing where they digitally corrected your, corrected yeah, your they gaze. Did, they did announce that at a WWDC, but I've never actually seen anybody use it. Uh, and I don't <laughs> see a setting for it in your camera control. So uh, it may be a thing they worked on and they really thought it was cool, and then it's probably uncanny valley when somebody's head isn't in the right place, but their eyes are okay, you know. It's kind of like something's creeping me out. And I don't know what it is, but something's not right. <laughs> might be might be one of one of those. Scenarios. I also don't know what it would do with two people in the frame. You know, would it correct just one person or both, or would they look cross-eyed? I don't know. <laughs> or like you know, put it take it right to its limits. You know, I mean, we've got a lot of technology when we have like a camera that just moves itself into your view, you know, and it follows you along as you, as yeah, you let's move put around. it behind the screen. Why can't they do that? Right. You know, <laughs> all right, let's go to our next question. And it's from JJ McKenna in Santa Venetia, California. JJ asks, I wanted to watch last journey of Paul WR, but the English dubbing is painfully horrible. Where can I watch this in the original language online? I see. Um, let's see, Mitchell? They've got some technology out there. I think it's called 1890. Uh, is a show that's uh, uh, about a ship at sea. And it is definitely being spoken in a foreign language, but the English dubbing uh, magically seems to work with it. Uh, you can switch between uh, the uh, different languages, and magically the lips are in sync with it. So I think there's software that'll do it and also match the lip movements, sort of like our previous question, uh, in this case, matching lips to uh, match the uh, uh, the language that's being used. And, and 
Mitchell, have you um, experienced uh, being able to take in some movies that way? Is it, uh, do you settle into it after a while of watching it? No, like you just previously said, something's wrong. You know, you don't quite know <laughs> what it is, but something's definitely wrong. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Um, Dave? You know, there's a lot more to communicating than just watching somebody's lips and, and hearing their voice. They use their face, their hands, their expression, their posture. And in some languages, gestures don't match what the guy's saying. Uh, so, yeah, the uncanny part of it is that you're getting the English version, but you're not getting all the Italian passion. So, Well, if, if there's anything we can tell from science fiction, at least they'll have this problem solved in the 24th century. Because all of the Star Trek communicators I saw, their mouths were perfectly in sync, speaking perfect English. All the mm -hmm. aliens. You know, and, look, look, and universal too, translator. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So but there we go. We have that to look forward to. Let's go to our next question. Steve Yurov in Madison, Wisconsin, asking, I found the Bluetooth range on the M1 Mac Mini to be far inferior to an M1 Air located right next to it. Any tricks for improving mini Bluetooth range? And Steve, I wonder, um, you mentioned about the range, but um, the antennas for a lot of these devices are sometimes located on a particular part of the chassis um possibly a laptop um, might have one located in a different area i wonder about what you might have that's uh, maybe local to it um or if you can find out where exactly that antenna is and free it from obstructions or point it in the direction that might be helpful uh go ahead mitchell yeah, Josh, you're exactly right. I mean, it, just the positioning on your table, wherever you put the computer, whether it's the laptop or the mini. Um, I have a mini that's under the desk, and if I uh, put a plate and under, underneath it to hold it, uh, that plate can interfere with the Bluetooth uh, positioning. So it's a matter of moving things around and trying to see if uh, changing its location on your desk is going to change your range for where it needs to be. Yeah, another thing that people like to do with Mac Minis is put them in docks. So while the docks are very convenient, they might um, they might hinder some of the RF. Let's go to our next, our next question. Ronnie Hofsey in Tromso, Norway, asking, using Blackmagic Ultimat is a very nice hardware solution for live production. For post-production, what is the favorite software solution? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I don't do a lot of keys in uh, posts, so I'll just say that probably your favorite polygon is the one you like. Uh, you have to try a lot of them uh, before you find one that does a key that you're happy with. Uh, green screen in post is uh, problematic at the best. And uh, Alex often refers to Luma Keys as his favorite method of cutting out backgrounds. And you might explore more about how Luma Keys operate and how you trim the cutout and tune the edges uh, all around the hair and shoulders. Uh, lighting of your original subject is key to make things look realistic. And um, I'm not sure any of the post-production stuff accounts for that. So it's all about the clipping and the voltages and the waveforms and in post uh, than it is for pre-compositing these things. And then in post, it's easy to just cut the shot. Yeah, I'm kind of with you as far as experience for a post. Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, when you're shooting, a lot of times it, you can make a huge difference in the time it takes in post to fix a green screen. If you properly light it uh, and you properly position a talent in front of the, uh, uh, the green screen, you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble. I get a lot of jobs where uh, the green screen was not properly shot and uh, they asked me to fix it, and there's ways of getting around it. Um, I like to use After Effects. If it's a simple uh, green screen, I can use Key Light. Um, it works pretty well for just about everything, but if you're gonna get into some trouble and you need to really start messing around, um, Primat is probably one of the best ones out there. Uh, the former uh, Red Giant software version of it, now Maxon, uh, was a great program because it gives you all of the abilities to affect the inner and outer lines on the keys so you can uh, de refine the edges around your hair and things like that. Uh, there are other techniques and tr uh, tricks you can use in post uh, that you can't do in real time, and that is uh, mats. 
You can uh, use garbage mats to uh, reduce the problem. And you can also break the key down into different parts of the body. You can do the head if it's complicated around the hair. You could do that separately from the body and you combine them all in different layers. So uh, After Effects and Primat is my preferred method for fixing a problem. Thank you, Mitchell. Next question. Craig McFarlane in Boston, Massachusetts. Any comments on the new Razer 4K webcam with one and a half inch, 1.2, excuse me, Sony sensor? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I had a peek at this while uh, we were waiting for the question to come through, and it's intriguing. Uh, A larger sensor, of course, gives you more optical flexibility. It, It gives you more color space. So things are more accurate. It's a 4K camera at 30 FPS. Uh, It has uh, an iris shutter, so you can cover up the lens. But it also suggests that it has optical zooming, and that's intriguing to me. I've been looking for optical zooming for some time, and it might not have been possible with smaller sensors. So with a bigger sensor, putting a larger lens on the front, which the thing looks like it has a pretty darn good big lens on the front, uh, gives you a chance to be able to zoom in or zoom back and get a wider view that's more natural and has the optical shape rather than just the digital cropping shape. Uh, It also does uncompressed uh, 4K, which is quite a claim. So it will be interesting to see where this goes. It's called the Razer Kyo Pro Ultra. I don't know if you have any more superlatives you can add on the end, Mark III, uh, you know, spatial. But anyway, uh, the idea that this is a bigger frame and a bigger sensor is is a good thing. And how well it manages all the other things about webcams, such as where they position on your monitor and what they show behind you, that's going to come out in the wash when people start using them. Yeah, it also comes out in the wash if you forget and put it in your pocket. Um, I'm curious, I was looking at the uh, specs and they really brag about having a large sensor and I'm looking at the specs and I'm not seeing the sensor size. So I'm imagining it's probably in the one half inch sensor size. If I had to guess. Um, well, it's slightly smaller, slightly smaller than a one inch. It's a one and 1.2 inch. One over um, 1.2. One over 1.2, so. Gotcha. Yeah, it's nearly one-to-one, but slightly smaller by, a, a, I don't know, 20% there. Uh, most webcams are using a quarter-inch sensor, which is like one-eighth the size of this one-inch, so, or one-sixteenth maybe. Yeah, I'm not doing my math well today. Um, so it's certainly seven or eight times more uh, image space to work with. And I see that the field of view they're saying is 82 to 72 degrees. And I believe, I'm, I'm not sure if the Brio starts out at 90. It's at 90 degrees, I believe, at its widest. I haven't used a Brio, so I can't say. Yeah, and um, I wonder if that is the, the optical adjustment. But having something that's more narrow, um, a 75, it says there, 72, is something a little more... Um, head and shoulders standing and sitting in front of a computer more Mm -hmm. so than what a lot of other 4k cameras are so it looks interesting it's interesting also before we know how hot it gets because you know operating in 4k and processing that in the camera in the past has had difficulty with small enclosures and if this one with its bigger enclosure has more heat dissipation it might find that it doesn't get hot when you're using it as 4k yeah, I mean, it's right in that that price range. Uh, $300 US uh, is right about the same price range where all of the the best cameras are, uh, are link uh, situates mm. uh, squarely in that. So um, yeah, it's got a larger sensor than the link. So that might be something worth looking at. Mm-hmm. Thanks for bringing it question. to our attention. Yeah. Let's go to our next question, Mitchell. Tony Mobley, Nuna, Georgia, asking, I continue to be happy with the Shoot app and my XS Max as my primary camera. Is anybody on the panel using an iPhone in their setup with Filmic or Shoot? Go ahead, John. 
I occasionally will use an iPhone or an iPad connected through my ATEM as a secondary camera. I don't use it as a primary camera at all. And I'm usually using the Shoot app or the Video Pencil app when I do that. It's to do things like take a picture of my keyboard or my ATEM or that sort of a thing. John? I've used uh, the 10 and my setup as an over-the-shoulder shot. I did use Filmic Pro up until recently, but it was not stable long term. It would uh, exit itself after uh, 45 minutes to an hour. So I found a another app and I've been using that. Okay, very good. I think um, Michael Force is going to have a, a lab for us coming up soon. So look forward to that in our daily email. Let's go to our next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, what is your cloud hierarchy? In other words, how do you rank cloud storage destinations like Google, Amazon, et cetera, in order of priority? And which do you trust the most? Jesse. Um, we, we do like using pCloud. The reason that I like using that one is because it was a one-time payment, not a monthly or yearly subscription. Uh, that's just for general cloud storage for media delivery. We definitely enjoy Frame IO and the clients like that. And we used to use Dropbox, but we had to stop using it because they kept telling the clients that they needed to pay for a subscription to download the video. And it was very confusing because they're, you know, just pushing for sales uh, and it, it annoyed everybody. I don't know if they fixed that. And if so, I hope somebody on the, the panel will correct me. Yeah, it's... Um... Companies need money. <laughs> Go ahead, John. So as an enterprise, we use a wide variety of providers. i um, not going to say which enterprise, but um, I have experience with uh, Google, Azure, uh, AWS, Oracle, uh, all the big providers. And I have to say, I don't trust any of them. Uh, we have to validate our data. We have to uh, monitor it. You can't just put it up there and leave it. You have to validate it. You have to make sure that it's still accurate because data corruption happens even in the cloud. So just remember, it's not so much do you trust them, it's what are you doing to make sure you don't have to trust them. Well put, Mitchell. Yeah, for uh, for storage in the cloud, uh, Paul, I like uh, iCloud for my iPhone, but all of my other stuff, uh, particularly my editing computer, have to be air-gapped. And it just simply means I'm not connected to the internet because the corporate and uh, pharmaceutical clients that I have require that nothing gets outside of the, uh, the computer editing system, and that's the way I have to do it. So I have to sneaker that everything to them if they require copies. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, what have the panel's experiences been with Starlink? I'm looking at an apartment where it will be the only option, and I've heard it has gone downhill with the introduction of data caps. Well, Douglas, I assume um, that you're looking at the base model uh, Starlink. So yes, that does have some limitations over the premium uh, that uh, the Starlink is offering. And um, the main application for Starlink is rural areas, uh, mostly for a couple of reasons. One, density. Um, their cell uh, sites are are huge as compared to you know cellular. You know, not not cell sites, but you know, the same type of sites that they have. Uh, they can just add more towers inside of an urban environment where there's only so many satellites that they have. They're they're increasing the number of them. Um, and your Starlink wants to see lots of the sky. So if you're not in the very top of the highest building uh, of that apartment in the urban environment, it might not be the fit for you. But if you take a stroll out into the country, that might be an option. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, there are a couple of other alternatives. If you're having problem with the Starlink, uh, HughesNet, one of the originals, um, has another system that you point out a specific geosynchronous satellite. It's not built like the Starlink. So if you're having problems with trees and things like that, uh, reaching the full sky to get Starlink to work, that's an alternative. And I think I saw an ad just the other day for another direct uh, satellite link system that's good for rural areas also. Yeah, and if you're in, uh, in a more urban environment, um, you can get some of these mobile um, 
providers for uh, you know terrestrial internet. So like a, so some of the typical mobile uh, cell phone providers, they'll give you a, a modem and they'll give you a plan that's you know uh, it's not set it's set up. So you might check into some of those options. Let's go to our next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas asked, did LastPass bite the dust? Go ahead, John. Oh, I'll make it a little short. Every single security professional I've talked to has left LastPass. So yeah, they're gone. They're they they may be they're they're gonna be around for a little while, but I think they're gone. Uh, as far as a player in the field. Just thinking about a pun making the last pass around the track, but I'll I'll withhold that. I'll withhold that one. Let's go to the next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael. The Yamaha DX7 synthesizer turns 40 this year, and many are still working today. In your personal purchasing strategy, do you aim for long-term viability over lower initial acquisition cost, or do you balance both concerns? Go ahead, Dave. Uh, I think, think you're muted there, Dave. Sorry about that. Um, I'll start again. This looks to me to be a buy once, cry once situation. Uh, best advice I gave uh, when I first started buying computers and stuff is get the best one you can afford. And whatever money you have handy, uh, lay it in and hope that it lasts a long, long time. So yeah, long-term viability is a huge consideration when considering buying hardware because the support for that hardware might disappear if a company gets bought or taken over or that model goes out of use and it's replaced with a super new model with the Ultra, um, you find that there's no more support for it. But with things like synthesizers, I mean, they're durable. They have to get through a lot of band operation and travel and shipping and all the rest. So yeah, you want durability and long-term viability. Um, the purchasing strategy, of course, is, well, how much do I need this device? And that's true for anything. If I know that the device I buy will pay for itself, uh, that's an easier decision. So if I buy a microphone and I know I'm going to use it every week and it's going to generate tens of thousands of dollars for me, then I get a $10,000 microphone. Go ahead, Mitchell. I think most musicians would purchase something back 40 years ago, like a Yamaha DX7 or a Prophet 5 based on the sound it makes and the usability of the device. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to know that it's going to work 40 years later, but I don't think that was a concern. I think they were actually going after the sound, particularly in that application. John. Generally speaking, from an economics perspective, um, a higher fixed cost, like purchasing something more expensive to start, incurs higher risk, but that also implies higher reward when you're successful, as opposed to renting equipment, for example, which is a higher variable cost, um, which would lower your risk overall, but also increase your total cost. Yeah, I notice how audio equipment and mus musical equipment really tends to hold its value. And I wonder who would be the expert to bring on to ask about like actually making investment in equipment. That doesn't uh, you know you can use and and sell for uh, a lot of what you uh, a lot of what you bought sometimes more uh, than what you purchased it for not so much with video equipment and other more uh, highly technical things but audio and musical equipment uh, tends to tends to hold its value. Let's go to our next question. Next question in from Harshid Trivedi from Daytona Beach, Florida. What is your process for transferring two FA info between two devices, John? I think uh, this is a com more complicated question than the simplicity of it indicates. Are you talking about transferring the token or are you talking about transferring the digits? Uh, if you're talking about transferring the token, the whole the whole thing between your, uh, you know, the generator that's running on your device, then you're going to need to use some sort of uh, cloud-based synchronization between devices or rely on one device to have your stuff, your tokens. For transferring numbers, I typically type them in um, because I don't have any sort of syncing in my work computer and my iPhone. 
Uh, for personal use, I just copy them off my phone and then paste them into my Mac most of the time. Um, but that's how I handle that kind of stuff. Good, Harshit. Yeah, so to add to that, uh, that is uh, basically what I'm asking. And to use the example, Facebook, right? Uh, would you deactivate your two-factor, go to the new app, reactivate two-factor and call it a day or would as in this case as we're talking about transferring of tokens uh, either write them all down or um uh do the other process of uh, as you mentioned which could be a little bit more elongating taking the whole token and all of that but uh, every app is different so i was just trying to figure out what the process might be with the panel go john so I'm in the process of having to move all my tokens off of LastPass to uh, uh, another service provider. What I'm having to, now, what some people do, uh, I think Steve Gibson does this, is he will take the QR code and save it offline somewhere. And then you can use the two QR code to sync up the new application. Um, I generally go into, uh, I just did it uh, earlier today, where I went into the site where I wanted to reset. I deactivated two-factor, I re-enabled two-factor, and then copied it into the new app, you know, took the screenshot of the QR code. I don't tend to save the QR codes, um, but everybody's different. Let's go to our final question. And a final question from Douglas Carmichael. It was said that F1 driver Michael Schumacher's head injury could have been caused by a GoPro camera mounted to a skiing helmet. Would a Marshall or a similar lip camera mounted differently be safer for adventure sports work? Mitchell. That was a very unfortunate accident, and I don't think that the camera had anything to do. It was just pure chance uh, with the circumstances of, of his accident. And it's a it's a it's a darn shame because he's an excellent driver and a great person. John, I'm not trying to be pedantic today, but the injury was caused from getting in a wreck, and it might have been more severe based on the safety equipment he was wearing. Uh, but it is an important distinction. All right. Well, we'd like to thank our producers, all of our questions, and all of our panel for answering our first hour questions. But our session's not over. We've got our second hour of education. Um, what are we looking forward to? Well, today we're going to continue this week's theme and ask our producers to brainstorm with us about what they'd like us to cover during Education Hour. Uh, we'll use these ideas for future shows, and as we prepare for the next couple of months, the, that input will be very helpful. So if you want, stay with us uh, through the little break while we prepare our program, settle our panelists in their chairs and uh, get edu education hour started in just a little while. Goodbye, everybody. Morning, Aaron. Good morning. 
I'm uh, presuming John will be reading our questions today, unless you felt like doing it. I'm game for whatever. Mm -hmm. John? No preference. Oh, great. Now I get to go eeny, meeny, mighty mo. Is that right? My votes for uh, Aaron. Okay. Aaron. Two votes for Aaron. Okay. Harshid wants Aaron to read too. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, John, I just wanted to review. I'm going to go through the list of suggestions we gathered on the 24th, and I didn't compare notes with you. So I'm going to run through like 10 or 11 suggestions from then. Uh, and then if you hear of one that you know of that I missed, uh, I'll go to you and say any any ones you want to add to this list. Was there a meeting I missed? Uh, the show on December 24 was an open discussion about what we think we want to hear about in the future on Education Hour. So um, we gathered from some uh, questions on Mukana and some ideas popped up and I'll walk through those as an opening here. And then we'll uh, we'll carry on from there and give people a chance to put their ideas in Mukana. I'm going to hang around for a little bit. I've got CES follow up stuff. Stay as long as you like there, John. Thank you, Dave. Can you open the pod bay doors, Dave? <laughs> I'm sorry, John. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> Well, we're getting close to that time, aren't we? Another maybe 15, 20 years. We'll have Hal. Yeah, Hal GPT. Yeah, exactly. Good morning, Chris. Did you did you guys talk about AI and education hour yet? <clears throat> not formally, no, not as a subject. It has come up during questions, though. I'd be interested to hear your guys' opinions. All this week, Office Hours has been asking producers to submit ideas for programming our weekly themed shows, as well as for some of our lab opportunities and after hours. Today, we're going to follow up on what was discussed just before Christmas Day, uh, where our producers sent in all kinds of good ideas for us to consider. I'd like to begin my listing with what I noted from December 24th as a starting point for other ideas, and you can put your ideas in Mukana, and we'll be able to take them up and discuss their value and, and where they fit in our idea of education hour. Uh, then we'll see what's a good idea to pursue and uh, have discussions about that. So put your uh, ideas into Mukana. They don't have to be in the form of a question, but just suggestions to us for the whole show today. I'm going to start with uh, item one for my list from the 24th was the gamification of education and education software. Uh, the second one was storytelling. Uh, how do you compose and tell great memorable stories uh, with an embedded big idea that a teacher is trying to introduce? This came from Bob Sturdivant uh, on the 24th, and he said that remembering is helped tremendously by re-entering the context in which one first learned something. If you're in a completely different context, it is a much heavier lift. Remembering is context dependent, he says, if a story is involved that includes that which is to be remembered, that too will help. 
Uh, the third idea suggested to us was psychology, and this had to do a little bit with uh, dealing with trauma on students, and uh, Georgia Dow was suggested as a guest, so we'll probably reach out and see if she wants to make herself available for us. Um, we did have a discussion about dealing with trauma and the, and the role of teachers there, but uh, we'll uh, consider that for a future one in a broader sense of uh, not just how teachers apply psychology or have to know about psychology of people, but, but how to respond when a, a student is suffering some sort of psychological issues or mental illness. Uh, workflow as it applies to education, that's for how things get done and, and in what way things flow through the classroom and class planning process. Uh, learning more about using PDFs is our fifth one. And that included uh, tagging a PDF and putting cross links in a PDF where reference points in a PDF can jump to a page and you can read the reference and then go back to the page you were on. Um, we're going to look into that as well. Uh, it's something actually that I had a great deal of experience with uh, some years back. So I'll bring my knowledge up to date and we'll do something on PDFs. Uh, number six was Bloom's taxonomy it was suggested that we explore more about that and we may have to visit Bloom many times because it's very important to some of the people who contribute to our program. Uh, seven was machine learning and AI in the educational context. And uh, I know there's a whole lot of office hours people who want to talk about the education aspect of and the implications for teachers with uh, AI driven text and AI driven visuals and that's and future of course AI driven video. Uh, number eight was managing your teacher career and the uh, what was suggested is an internal dialogue when in uh, what was described as a flat profession don't know what that is but it's part of that contribution by Peter Belbin and how to keep the work life fresh so it'll be a an opportunity to sort of offer ideas on how to keep what you're doing fresh and that's good for any profession not just for education. Uh, number nine is taking time to get to know your classmates and forming a learning community in the early stages of teaching a course. This comes from Douglas Carmichael and his suggestion was to just be more of a community of learners and, and I know Chris here on our panel uh, often is speaking to that community of learning. So yes, we're going to probably look at that uh, whole classmate learning community thing. Uh, number 10 was setups for showing and telling an online class. Uh, that'll be a fun technical one for some people, and we might have to have a couple of people who do online sort of uh, presentations and desktop samples and examples uh, in order to show what a good setup looks like and how much it costs and how, what it takes to support that kind of thing. And finally, on my list, expanding Saturday to a full two hours of discussion and questions for the panel to address. Uh, that didn't come from December 24th, it just came up recently, that it's been offered to us that we can now probably occupy the entire two hours of Saturday for education discussion. So we'd like your input on that as well. So uh, I'm just going to toss to John here to see if he has any that he got from that, that session and uh, whether he's adding to my list. Thanks, Dave. Um, I don't have any additional from what we talked about on the 24th. I know we have an existing list of upcoming topics we had originally brainstormed. And I think for me, and I'd love to hear our producers' opinions and thoughts and um, to talk about what the producers want. It's always been a challenge when we're thinking of education hours. Education is really broad. We do have classroom teachers, Aaron and uh, pre-K to 12, we have uh, higher education teachers, professors here. We have people who educate the workforce. We have the principles of just how do you learn or help other people learn because all of us teach in some way. And I think for me, that's the, been the tension of education hour is how do we identify something that's helpful to all of us and make sure we have a nice broad perspective. Um, but I'm happy to hear other panelists' thoughts on that, especially sure. those who weren't here on the 24th. So Aaron is reading today, and we'll go to our first idea. Okay, our first question comes to us from TJ Asher in Minneapolis. Since things have been more normal regarding education and in-person classes, what can we do to help keep technology and the lessons we learned over the past couple of years 
moving forward in education? That's an excellent question, because we're now struggling with the idea of how does how does the debate continue? How does the conversation about tech in the classroom and the support for teachers uh, continue to penetrate that that veil of administration? So uh, this should be a very good discussion and should be we should bring some people in who are supporting classroom teachers and have them talk to us a little bit about how they're carrying on the pra practice and and integrating and hybriding uh, technology in, in classroom study now. Uh, we'll start with Aaron and go to John. I think one of the biggest things, just to tie in our previous conversation and the question, is the concept of the, the idea of teaching teachers something, showing them something on Saturday, and then bringing it into the classroom on Monday. That is something that all teachers, regardless of the age group they teach, can use. Um, from John Corpo and the Edge of Protocol seminar, I was able to bring, remind myself of something that I haven't used before and use it in my classroom on Monday morning. And it was very helpful. So I also think back to the shows, John, that you did um, about the PowerPoints, about how to make a good PowerPoint. Um, I think those things have to be acknowledged, remembered, and brought back into the fold because while many in-person teachers, or I'm sorry, while many remote teachers are still using some of the great technology like the mics and the lights and everything, there are teachers in the classroom who don't necessarily need those items in front of them um, while they're teaching in person in front of kids. But there are other things like different softwares and gamifying things that would help teachers bring that technology from the, the remote learning to daily teaching that will help them. Thanks. John Snyder. As a topic idea, um, I think it's a, a great idea and great question because it's almost as if we've gone two steps forward and one step back from going totally virtual to being backwards to hybrid in some ways and other ways we're trying to identify what the next steps forward are as an industry so i think there's a lot of conversation there from multiple different levels and then aaron what you're saying um, i almost wonder if it'd be helpful to have a regular excuse me debrief or something where the the purpose of the week is to say here's what i implemented in the past three or six months and here's you know what i learned how i implemented it and what I learned from implementation, like a, a hot wash. Hmm. And Harshid. So on the 30th of last year, we talked about a app about accessibility. And then this year, we, as we started off, so many things started making more sense. And if we look at what the question says, what we learned in the last two years, I've been a part of a community called iBug Today out of Houston, and they've been on Zoom as a platform. And there's so many other aspects of tools that we've constantly made better over time. So, you know, when we dive into some of these ideas, we might want to dive into certain aspects of how do we continuously keep making things better or how do we give impact to what might, you know, have some work to be done. So it would be a nice discussion to have even in if it is an accessibility aspect that we might look at, or if we might look at it in a broader aspect of how do we generate the internet to be, or the classroom to be, and the tools, what do they look like, and how will they benefit us at the long term? In the long term. Mm -hmm. Good point, Aaron. Harshid, I completely agree. I think a lot of teachers can get overwhelmed by some of the technology used for accessibility purposes. And to see someone actually using them, whether it's a demonstration, whether it's a short video from a classroom, obviously just focused on the teacher, not the students at that point, I think that would be really helpful. Um, also, I just had a connection that if, if teachers had something, regardless of whatever they were working on, if they had, whether it was a PowerPoint or whether they had a lesson and they said, and they could bring it or share it in Discord. And we could look at it, kind of take it apart and say, here's how we would use technology with it. How Here's how we can make it paper and pencil in case 
you know, Wi-Fi goes out in case the power goes out, giving teachers that ability to be flexible, to show them what can be done with the tools that they have, not that they might have to go out and get separately. Because I know teachers in my building are happy to go get a cord or to go get, you know, something extra that's within their grasp. But if it's something that's too too technical and not broken down enough, it's going to be more frustrational than anything. Mm-hmm. No, that's true. John, do you want to close it up? Yeah, I think um, what Aaron just described, I would put as, as a second topic or type of topic is how do we, um, like the Ruthless Redo of PowerPoint that we did, how do we encourage people to share that? And I, I mean, it'd be really cool to have a teacher who's, knows they want to do something with a video to teach topic X, some physics topic, for example, and then have a panel who has professional video folks on talking about how they might approach it, how you might frame a, a scene or something like that. So I think that's a really uh, promising idea if we can get the contribution of the uh, lesson plan. It seems to me what I'm hearing in answer to this idea is if we were to do more demonstrations, that people could then access offline or when they're not available here uh, to just see what is a good idea and then adapt it to their own purpose. Just be able to take an idea from us and say, well, I could do that, but differently. Uh, Chris? Just one final idea, which is uh, back to TJ's question about or issue about um, the return to normal means that um, most teachers have stopped struggling with how to teach, how to take themselves at a distance to the students, to the classroom. And now everybody's, most everybody's back in the classroom face to face. But one of the ways in which we can still keep things moving forward, as TJ suggests, is to think about bringing a guest into your classroom now that the teacher and the, the students are back together and many teachers have been um, prepared to use technology more than they have in the past. I'll give an example. My uh, daughter-in-law is a music teacher, orchestra and band teacher, and um, for years she has uh, taken the approach of preparing a piece with the orchestra and st studying a little bit about the composer. These are uh, living composers. And then inviting the composer to come into the classroom re from remote and hear the student's rendition of their piece and then uh, have this guest composer talk with them about how he or she compose the piece and compliment the students on their uh, rendition of his work and so forth. And of course, you can imagine being a student in that uh, class, you'd have a much deeper connection with, with the music, with the composer, and uh, a little bit of a peek behind the curtain of what it takes to become a composer. Um, the composers are all very gracious and eager to say yes to this, uh, to it's not inconvenient for them because they don't have to drive to New Jersey or fly to New Jersey to uh, to meet with the uh, middle school kids, and the kids love it, and it's is a kind of a mm -hmm. um, high point. But uh, before COVID, um, many other teachers were uh, reluctant to do it because they hadn't mastered the um, technology to bring some a guest in with good audio and good video uh, into their classroom. Now, many, many more have those capacities, um, but they might be helped by being reminded that there's this uh, new potential here. It hadn't occurred to me until you mentioned it that, yes, leveraging what they've already learned to enhance the classroom experience might be a focus for us. Yes. Aaron? Somehow, Chris, you got me to think about this and maybe it was something tangential, but I appreciate it nonetheless. What I'm thinking about the concept of 
showing an educational topic, John, like you had said, like a lesson, like if I'm teaching subtraction with regrouping, throwing my lesson plan onto Discord or even somewhere in Mukana and having everybody similar to the coffee challenge adapt it some way, make it Mm -hmm. interesting in what, excuse me, in what you bring to the table because everybody has a different perspective on things. And honestly, I would love to see some of my lessons um, go through people like Chris, like Dr. Clark and Harshid and Dave and John and see what you all would do with the technology that I have and the resources that I have available to me and similar to other teachers so that we can kind of get a different perspective because there might be something from John's idea that might make me think of something else and allow me to help my students more accurately. Mm -hmm. No, and that's, these are all really good ideas here. Uh, Let's get our next idea. Our next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How can we go beyond the knee jerk ban it mindset and critically evaluate new technologies like chat GPT and how our educational methods should change in response to it. That is interesting. Every new technology has a rebound effect. I mean, I, I've used this analogy before and I'll use it again. The microwave oven appeared and everyone thought it was dangerous. Uh, everyone thought this was not the way to cook food and maybe nuking food was the term people used to make a derogatory remark about using a microwave. But then these uh, manufacturers and food packaging people found ways to make it easier for us to do that. And of course, reheating a, a previous meal is or an earlier pizza uh, became more commonplace and then the convenience of it set in. Uh, we don't yet know for sure what chat GPT's best use is, what will be the killer application for it, and will it help us win it bingo better? I don't know. And I think in some sense we have to wait and see. So a knee-jerk ban on it might just be an indication by the admin that they'd like more time to look at it, but I don't think it's sort of like a legal ban that this is a horrible thing and we've already passed judgment on it, et cetera. So we've got a few hands up here and let's go through starting with Jesse. I think this question speaks to one of the biggest concerns on my mind and that is uh, the contentious way so many dialogues have been framed in the last five years. And, you know, we've since the beginning of social media, we've seen it on this steady increase and um i i Mm. i feel like the office hours panel is a little bit sometimes playing into that contentious dialogue where we see an article on the school admin has has banned x or banned y technology when a lot of the times if you go down the rabbit hole and you talk to the to the administrators they really just need time to bring their teams up to speed on on what this technology is the technology is native to us because we're fascinated by it and it is our hobby that became our career but it's not it's not the the central point of focus for everybody and certainly not everybody in academia so i would i would love to see see us uh, contribute to to the solution to this problem as as we do. This is one of the reasons I'm enthusiastic about office hours is because I do feel like it's one of the best manifestations of of this type of conversation. But this is one area that I feel like we could improve in is um, is speaking with with more clarity and calmness when it comes to other people's choices of how they integrate technology into their workflow. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was reminded in a previous conversation about how classrooms used to have just one or two computers and students had to sort of wait for their turn on the computer. And it isn't until computers were ubiquitous in the home that schools started realizing they should they should have the same access to it in the classroom. Mark Giuliani next. I think office hours is a great opportunity with the reach we have with all the people that follow office hours to reach out to the people who wrote chat. GPT and try and get them to help teachers to come on and talk about to teachers how to use the, it as a tool to be uh, a more efficient way to do research. You're not going to ban it. It's it's like trying to ban Google. 
So teach the teachers how it can be used to do research more quickly and what to look out for and what it can do and what it can't do. Maybe there's somebody in office hours who can give us access to somebody who worked at GPT and uh, can get us someone to talk about it on Education Hour. Erin? My thoughts about this, and I'm wondering if I'm channeling Alex right now, is let some kids who really understand technology, I'm thinking fifth grade and up, give them a bunch of materials, like tests that you are going to give and see if they can cheat the system. Just see if they can figure out chat GPT and what it can do. And then that can be a reflection for the educators that if your material can be run through Google, run through chat GPT and get answers that quickly, are we really evaluating students' knowledge or the ability for students to regurgitate what we've taught them? Mm -hmm. and, and are they learning to research as well? Yes. Are they learning to research or are we just teaching them that critical thinking doesn't matter and it's just, can you answer this very basic question? It's yeah. that concept of Bloom's taxonomy where if it's in the bottom three tiers, it's something that can probably be searched for online very easily. Um, and then once you go up to the three tiers on the top, you're able to, you know, think more critically. So I'm thinking that we definitely shouldn't ban it. Um, I know I saw a kind of, I think it was somewhere on TikTok, a teacher put in a question about IEP goals and the chat GPT wrote IEP goals based on what the teacher put in. And I'm thinking that if you're not good with words and you're not good with wording things on an IEP, maybe this could actually be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would coach you almost in the sense that it would show you examples of how that's done. And then you, I mean, people read other people's essays to learn how to write essays. So it might be a way of giving people resources that help them learn the proper way of doing things, not the automated way. John? That was uh, some really great ideas. Um, I, I think this as a topic, just this one one suggestion from Douglas, we've we've discussed th th at least three different ways to approach it. Um, I think we could have a full week on um, how to manage or respond to any new technology and what questions should you be asking as a teacher and how do you have those conversations with your administration or as a parent. Uh, we had a question just generally about what's the future of AI in education and how will that change what we're doing? I think that's like a forward looking conversation. Um, mm -hmm. with a special guest like someone from OpenAI. Uh, GPT-specific week, how do you use it? What does it mean? Um, recommendations, which, um, by the way, I put asked ChatGPT to write me some uh, learning objectives, and they were all terrible because it just learns from what's already out there, and most learning objectives are just on the lowest level. So it just kept saying, um, understand, 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 almost every single one. Um, and then lastly, I heard just from Aaron, I wonder if there's... Uh, an opportunity to have a week where we just talk about how to write IEP goals, if that's something that uh, education teachers struggle with. I don't know. I'm not familiar enough since I'm not a teacher, but I know my kids who have IEPs, um, their goals are all pretty much just copy pasted every year. <laughs> the shortest distance between two ideas is the yeah, cut and paste. Uh, okay. Douglas, that's a good discussion. I'm I'm absolutely certain Chat GPT is going to come up over and over again. It's the next big thing, and we're going to talk about it. But uh, that's a good idea for us to follow up on. Uh, next idea. Before I jump into the question, super quick, John, it might be difficult to do an IEP goals lab because because it's an individualized educational plan. Things might be copied from year to year for your child because it's based on them. So they're trying to keep it in that focus. But um, but yeah, learning some goals to say to maybe to change wording from understand to more higher level things would be really cool. So. Can I just take a second before the question as well? Could you tell me what IEP goals stands for? Like, what is that? Absolutely. So an IEP is an individualized education plan. So it's based off of testing that um, the special ed teacher does. It could be bringing in physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, 
um, school psychologist to get as much information on the child as possible. And then the team comes up with goals based on um, what, what strengths they need to work on or what they need to work on in order to be successful, both in the classroom and in the real world. Okay. I'm familiar with that in a different context with family plans. Yes. Okay. Next uh, idea from Paul. Our next idea comes to us from Paul Prakowski in Gainesville, Florida. Consider a scheduled monthly teaching lab rather than 52 weeks of a Q&A only. Hmm. That's an interesting consideration because it is sometimes a step-by-step -step process and you only have time in an hour to get through two or three of the steps when there's seven or eight. And so, yeah, we, we might have to have uh, a set aside one of our weeks each month to continue a, con a, a process through to conclusion. And maybe that's, that's a good way to go. John? I feel like once a month might be difficult to maintain. What we would really need is for our producers to join us in the Discord. And um, I think we need that conversation started first to make sure that we're adding value because we're asking people to take additional time out of their day, their week, their month, um, however often we do it. But this is something we've talked about for a long time. And I, I think it's a good goal to have as a group. Um, and it's a challenge to plan and deploy. So if you have any ideas, Paul, on a lab you would like to lead, please reach out to us in Discord. I think I'll add, too, that if there is a major decision to give us two hours instead of one, it's possible to make that second hour a lab and, and have our general discussion and our questions that are urgent or people are, uh, you know, really desperate to get an answer to, uh, and then follow it with some in-depth or deep dive into one thing. And that's how office hours during the week works, so it may work really well here as well. Uh, next idea. Our next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How can we go beyond parent involvement to truly acknowledging the role of parents in children's lives and help children develop the comfort and security that allows them to feel confident as adults? Hmm. Parent involvement. I, I, when I read that, I, I think of parent involvement in the school, but parents are naturally involved in children's learning. So... Acknowledging that role and, and supporting that role, that would be a very interesting pursuit, uh, an issue or two surfaces around that, and, and maybe we should spend some time on that. Yes. Aaron? I think parent involvement is very vital to a child's education, whether it's in the classroom or at home. I believe I actually did my master's thesis on this about children who read at home with their families, even through older ages, even if it's just reading recipes or things like that, reading them with their families, it gives parents a connection to what they enjoy reading and what they enjoy learning about. And then they can have a gateway to start having more conversations and more deeper understanding of their own child. I think in the classroom, um, parent involvement can be very helpful so that not only do teachers get some extra help in the classroom, but parents can actually see what goes on on a daily basis. Because, I mean, I can tell you my my husband makes me a tumbler, a 40-ounce tumbler of tea, about or 30-ounce tumbler of tea every morning. And I can tell you there's about at least a quarter of it left at the end of the day on my desk because I have no time to finish it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, granted, elementary is very different than middle school, high school, and beyond. But... There are some days where I cannot sit down to write an email back to a parent. So for them to come in and see that we're not just sitting around letting them watch videos and letting them hang out on the computer all day, um, to let them know that like we're sitting with your kids, we're learning um, new social emotional things and teaching them some of the strategies that we use in the classroom um, especially when it comes to emotional regulation and how we handle conflicts and arguments and misunderstandings, having mm -hmm. them be able to bring that vocabulary or that same dialogue home helps that home to school connection stay strong. Um, my, it's not well known, but it's been mentioned here before that my son was in a special program uh, with Project Approach. And 
uh, it was a different way of running a classroom because it looked like chaos to the outsider. And I had to help other parents understand what was being learned, how what they were doing was actually contributing to the learning in the curriculum. And when I put those dots together for other parents, they went, oh, they are learning math. That just doesn't look like it. Uh, they are learning. Uh, they're even learning music without anyone really noticing. And this kind of thing is is where parents need to be in the classroom once in a while. And who knows when they get the time to do anything to spend time in a classroom with a teacher. But if there were opportunities to observe or be part of it or even volunteer, uh, those are issues that then bring lesson and learning and education right back into the home to support whatever's happening in the classroom. If they just are farming it out, offshoring it to the teachers in classrooms, uh, they might find the effects are not effective as if they were to get involved. So yeah, parent involvement, I, I think, is truly a, a thing we should look at and, and address probably as a side issue almost in every subject we, we bring up here. Thanks for that, Douglas. Next idea. Our next question comes to us from Paul Prusikowski in Gainesville, Florida. Ideas, deeper dive into media enhanced education curriculum development planning, i.e., how do the most advanced educators plan a semester of media rich education? That'd be a good subject, yes. Um, I don't, I personally, I don't know how that happens, but I think if we were to find somebody who does know how that happens, then we'd be able to have a really good conversation about it because that goes to the workflow question earlier uh, that was submitted back in December is uh, looking at how a curriculum is developed and how you plan to use an existing curriculum and make the most of uh, any, I love the term media rich because then, then the emphasis is less on chalk and talk and more in experience. Uh, Harshid, your idea? And this would be really cool. And I know that uh, Keenan has spoke about uh, disaster uh, teaching elements that uh, he's using for his product right now. And perhaps to see what does it take for him to plan out his program that he wants to set out for people and uh, having that first hands on experience and maybe making tweaks live with him to say, well, this worked for me. This didn't, this delivery method isn't really working for me. So um, seeing what product maybe he's using and then canvas is another great program that um if we if anyone has access to it such as dr clark uh we could maybe make our own modules and kind of play with the elements as a demonstrative uh way of showing the product and so if we did do a demo to go kind of to the previous question as well um we could do the first week as an intro to topics second week and third week would be your beans and rice and then the last week would be that demonstration to make sure you're healthy enough you have all the information you need and then that last week we kind of demonstrate together and then have a follow-up in after hours or in labs in, in discord that could you know elevate that uh, momentum a little bit differently this 2023 that's an interesting sequence we'll have to explore that further um you and i maybe uh harshid uh have that more deeper conversation about how that would how that would pace and what we do in the sequence chris I just um, wanted to make the point that um, when planning a curriculum, um, a media rich curriculum in this case, um, my experience is that the best plans um, are held tentatively by the teacher. Um, the first cut at planning before we meet the students is really to organize myself say well what what are the big ideas that i think uh, would be useful to introduce here and what are some uh, engaging and innovative ways to introduce them and to provide opportunities for the students to actually act on these ideas rather than listen listen to me expound upon them um, but then the the second phase of planning happens when you actually begin to implement it 
you meet the students for the first time and they're, they don't know the script that you had in your imagination mm -hmm. when you made the, uh, the pre-plan. Uh, they're different people than you imagined and they bring different uh, gifts to the table. Mm -hmm. So it's time for con more or less continuous replanning. You're still within the, the broad framework that you've outlined, but um, you discover that there are other actors and other roles that students can play that you hadn't incorporated into your original plan. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to emphasize that uh, planning is a continuous process of uh, revision and adjustment. And uh, as you've, you mentioned earlier, Dave, uh, of community building and connection within the group. And uh, that usually makes the plan better than it would have been if you uh, rigidly implemented what you imagined in August um, was going to be the, the word curriculum means it's a word for racetrack, They're running in circles. Um, it seems very orderly, but it never really happens that way uh, mm -hmm. in the in the richest uh, educational experiences that I've been involved with. There was a caution that I used to give. Um, I, I worked in the support role at a, at, at a university in the education faculty, and my job was to make media that they would use in the classroom. So help them have a media rich education environment. I used to warn them that when you do this on video, it's going to be locked in cement, that it's this is the way it's going to be for the next six to eight years while you use this video in your classroom. And if anything about what you're teaching changes, uh, this video might quickly become obsolete. And they had to actually think about that way back at the beginning of the process how much of the media that I'm going to include in this environment is has got a shelf life. And it made for better videos when they finally cleaved out all the stuff they thought they were going to talk about and and leave in the video and, and move it back into uh, the presentation itself. Uh, so yeah, uh, the idea that it's, it's a continually changing and evolving just in time thing is normal for most teachers. Aaron? Yeah, Dave, I just the last thing that you said, like the concept that if you make a video or a media and your content changes, we have to find a new video or a new source for that. But I think tying back into the question, I think it's vital that we're able to get teachers and see teachers where they are and say, you know, your content better than than maybe other people on the panel. Okay, I think I probably know third grade curriculum. I can rattle it off the top of my head. Exactly. That doesn't mean that I know the best ways to incorporate technology into that content. So to reassure teachers that we're not here to change your content. We're, no, we're just here to try to make using technology, adding more media rich education to what you already know is going to help save you time. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that teachers need the most that they can't get at Christmas. They can't get at the end of the year as a gift in a beautiful little polar bear bag with a ribbon on it. Mm -hmm. We need time. And that's something that administrators try to give us. I know mine do, <laughs> um, but it's never enough. We always think we can do one more thing or add one more thing to it. Um, an example that I had from this week is that we had to give a test yesterday. Um, and one of the big parts about it was problem and solution. And I've been using videos. I've been using discussions. We've done paper and pencil. We've done online things. But then my co-teacher said, what if we made a next time, because we always spiral back, what if we made an escape room on Google Forms or through Google Slides? And I said, "Cool, that's fantastic. I love it. We have 10 minutes until ELA starts. So how do we do I can that? make yeah. <laughs> I can make a slide deck quickly. I really mm. can. I, I feel like that's a strength of mine, but I cannot make one that quickly. Um, mm. But that's the thing to to bring our content and our ideas to a panel like this and say, 
what can I do to take it from Dave? I love your words. I wrote it down the chalk and talk to something that's more interactive and more engaging Mm -hmm. because I know that, um, this past week we've talked about goals coming into a new year. And I asked the students, what do you want more of? And they wrote all these different suggestions. And one of them was grammar. Now Mm. that might not seem like a big deal, but I started using one of the edge of protocols that John and I were talking about. Um, but I took it actually out of the digital world and put it just on pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. And the kids are obsessed with it to the fact that they wrote, they want more of it. They asked if we could do it as like a fun activity, like something that they can earn at the end of the month. Like Mm. what if we had like extra time to do more grammar and my Mm. mind was blown, but that's just taking our content and using something more media rich, using a video or using a picture Mm. to get that engagement. So I think using what the teacher knows as content with what you all know in terms of media would make a beautiful, beautiful lesson. You remind me that actually I helped, uh, I I led a project uh, for training pilots and it was a multimedia, uh, a huge multimedia rich uh, teaching platform. Um, And I asked one of the subject matter experts, I had about six of these, helping us with the curriculum and, and incorporating the media and stuff. And he said, oh yeah, six months work before we even started it. Like just working with the other SMEs about how to coordinate what we're going to teach and then bring that to the guys who are going to make the materials that are going to get taught. And uh, I had thought they just knew this off the top of their heads. But in fact, no, they had to have many, many discussions, uh, many back and forth between them about what's important and what's not, and make sure that it was properly prepared so that my guys, when they are going to put it together into graphics and animation and and text, uh, that the whole thing fits and works. And they also knew that this is going to get locked in. Anything the military does is locked in for long periods of time in order to have consistency. But I I get your point that great ideas pop out of people's heads all the time. And then somebody has to actually do the calculation, how long it'll take us to get that made. And so an escape room concept is great. Uh, Three people working for a week, maybe that's when it gets done. Uh, We'll have our next idea. Our next idea come to us, comes to us from John Snyder. Rocket science. Use the next Garage Rocketeers as an opportunity to discuss how we would use the event to teach different age groups. I think we have someone who can address that right here. We'd be all for that. Uh, and, and we tried to do that last time, but we just ran out of time. We're going to launch in October the next big rocket that's being built right now. And so anything you guys want to do to, to integrate that in, uh, we're, we're happy to oblige. Thank you, John. And the other John? Yeah, I, I wanted to put it in our ears now because we missed it last time. <laughs> and I'm thinking if you were to launch in like October, for example, we'd probably want to be discussing it early summer so that people could do a lesson plan to deliver at the start of the school year. Um, but you, this is the timelines that you would want to be thinking about instead of, hey, there's a rocket launch in three weeks. Great idea. Yes, Aaron. So, John Prado, I have to say, my class loved, all my science classes loved watching the rockets. I have to say, it was, I only planned it for a week. So I only do, I'm only able to teach science twice a week for 45 minutes to each of the classes. And at the end of the second one, they were like, wait a minute, no, can you back that up? Can we watch that again? Because there's something that I noticed And these are third graders. So they're like so excited about space and rockets. And we actually built, we kind of like MacGyvered. um, Like I basically brought out all this equipment that we have so many extras of in our science kits. And I said, build a rocket using these materials. And then you can't touch the rocket, but you have to get it from the back of the room to the front of the room with your whole team moving it without touching the physical rocket. How would you do it? And I'm telling you that took about two weeks of time that I don't care that I lost time on other subjects or other topics down the line. They were so excited and they loved it. So I'm ready for it. 
whenever it happens. Well, we do the next one, sure. There's a lot of physics involved in rockets. Chris Clark. I just wanted to suggest that any educator who uh, wants to be involved with the rocket launch project in October ought to screen the movie October Skies, which it's old, but it's Mm -hmm. very timely and engaging. It's about rocketry uh, for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, Maybe John Preto as a young man was in that movie. I don't remember. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) The credits went by kind of quickly. We we did an interview. Uh, Garage Rocketeers did an interview of Homer Hickam, and he explained the whole thing. It's up on our YouTube channel. It's fantastic. Next idea. Our next idea comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How can we leverage technologies like Zoom, ISO, OSC, and Mukana to not only extend education beyond the school walls, but bridge classes together beyond geography. That's an idea I've had for a long, long time. Uh, Douglas, I I pitched this back in the day uh, that there would be sort of super professors who had thousands upon thousands of students tuning in or watching asynchronously uh, and participating in the discussions through a, a system like Mukana. And uh, now it's coming to pass. So yes, I think that's just a natural evolution. Take the actual operation of a classroom and extend it through Zoom and over the internet bridge to anybody in the world who needs to learn it. I know MIT have all their classes online. So it's sort of the beginning, the first footsteps of that. Aaron? So the way that I interpreted this question is similar to how I worked with my students when I was remote. So while I wasn't able to use Zoom, I had to use Google Meet. Um, We kind of used the chat similar to Mukana in that there was a question and answer section, there was a chat section, and the students were able to have those conversations with each other and with me so that I could, you know, understand where they were in terms of understanding what we were doing. So I think using Zoom and Mukana is a fantastic way to bridge not only beyond geography to like check out other schools and what they're learning, but to also tie in the students that we have right there in terms of some of them don't want to raise their hand and say something, Mm -hmm. but they feel very comfortable typing in the chat and having that discourse that way. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's really vital to make sure they're still part of the conversation Because I would notice and I would say, oh, look, you know, Susie here, you know, says or brought up this question. So I'm able to bring her who might not feel comfortable to into the whole discussion, even though she hasn't said a word. Um, I think that's incredibly important to remember. And then even just as simple as the concept of old fashioned pen pals Mm -hmm. using Mukana and Zoom or Google Meet or something to make connections with students across the country. Um, I'm actually part of a Facebook group for teachers in third grade who are teaching a certain um, reading curriculum. And there was a section that said, or there was a story that we read that was all about pen pals. And one of the suggestions in our teacher book was connect with another group of students from across the country. So teachers were posting on Facebook, I have 21 kids in Boulder, Colorado, who has the same amount of kids somewhere else. And teachers were making those connections. So while it wasn't Zoom or Mukana, they were able to hop on a video chat and they were able to talk about what they've been learning and different things that they do together. And I think they even played like a blue kit game together in a couple of different places, which was Mm -hmm. awesome. So it's a great way to bridge everything. Yep. And our next idea. Our next question comes to us from Jesse Mills. Take a look at some automated AV slash production systems within modern classrooms. Include a few teachers so that they can talk about what is subjectively simple for them and will produce their desired results. An interesting idea. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by automated AV production systems, but if it's smart boards or uh, video cameras and, and the kind of media production stuff, uh, yeah, what's most simple for them to do? Uh, handing uh, 12-year-olds uh, handy cams has been very productive for some teachers, 
and others it's a burden. So yeah, it, it might be worth just contacting a few people and maybe even having a, a sort of interview with them and bring that back to this discussion for further uh, enlargement of the idea. Uh, quickly, Chris, we're stacking in here. To be quick, I, I think this question or this suggestion um, gave me the idea that it's a, it's a common story that there's more technology in classrooms today than is actually being used or well used. So if we could focus instead of on here's something new that's never been in classrooms before, if we could also focus some of our discussions on how to how to get more use out of the technology that is already in your classroom but turned off or you're you're using the first level of its functionality but there are three or four or five more higher levels that are possible yeah um, yeah that's Thanks. I'll, I'll be i'll stop there next idea our next idea comes to us from douglas carmichael how can we integrate health, physical, mental, emotional, into the educational environments and modalities of the future, rather than as an afterthought? John Snyder. I agree. I think wellness would be a good ongoing topic to have once every couple of months. Okay. Aaron? I think the biggest piece about it is allowing, is making the parent connection, the home connection, with the concept of SEL to let the kids or social emotional learning to to help the teacher and the parents come together to help the child learn and grow. So social emotional learning should be done throughout the day, even if it's not a specific lesson, but the concept should be taught throughout the day of how to regulate emotions. If you're feeling kind of wiggly, can you stand up and walk around using fidgets, things like that? I think that's absolutely key to every classroom, regardless of age. All right. Next idea. Our next idea comes to us from Tony Mobley. Would it be possible to look at education hour to be continued immediately in after hour, depending on instruction or training on the need for that session? That's a possibility. Yes, I can say that there's probably a spillover, that if we have a second hour that's actually sort of I'm going to say workshop oriented. Uh, it might actually continue if the, if if there's a guest, uh, we would ask them if they'd want to be uh, inundated in a larger forum than just uh, education hour, uh, or if uh, we you know champion the idea of showing the rest of the world in after hours uh, what's going on in education hour. Uh, it's worth thinking about deeply. Yes, Tony. Uh, next idea. Our next idea comes to us from Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C. Homework offers students the opportunity to find out what they don't yet understand. Can a future episode focus on the tools developed during COVID to make tutoring more affordable? Zoom calls after school to help with homework? That's interesting. I never thought of that. That's a great idea. Aaron. Yeah, I think that's a great idea to figure out um, more connections that can be made after school. I know many districts are offering online tutoring after school, um, but really the the core of this to me was the concept of homework. Um, if you just flip the classroom and let them preview what's going to happen the next day and get a little bit involved with it, then they won't be as confused the next day and there's less paperwork for teachers to grade. In uh, my city, or the whole province, actually, uh, there was a channel for education, and they offered three hours of homework hotline uh, for students on television. And you could phone in, and a real teacher would walk you through whatever physics you're not understanding, whatever math you're not understanding, you'd talk about the grammar, uh, and, and the students would be online on the phone, and they'd be hearing the answer, and the teachers would be interacting with them directly. So, yeah, there's a way to do this. Uh, through all the other media channels that are there. John? I was just going to add, we do have a few people in our office hours community who specialize in uh, tutoring and outside the classroom learning. So it would be good mm. to bring them in. Great. Next idea. Our next idea comes to us from Jesse Mills. How to decide as a team when technology is too old for the classroom. Related, what to include on a zero budget 
$5,000 budget, 10K and 20K and above classroom modernization. This is a tricky question, Jesse, because administrators don't just think in the individual classroom. They look across whole counties sometimes and what kind of costs are going to be spread out over that and whether a, a, an economy can be found by having a larger installation of Chromebooks or something. And you can't really bring it down to a zero budget in a classroom. You have to consider a lot of other things and, of course, the cost of supporting any of those new technologies in a classroom. Aaron? I do think this actually really would be a good um, topic for the future because I, I, unfortunately, sometimes there is zero budget for certain items that teachers need. And I think being able to kind of MacGyver what we use or what we already have would be a great way to help teachers still use technology, but use what they have instead of spending money that isn't actually there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our next question? Our next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How can we move beyond new normal thinking into better normal thinking, leaving behind the conventions and the restraints of the past? I think this question is asking us to change the culture of the world, and that's a slow rolling rock with many people pushing on it and not all of them are pushing in the same direction so some people would like us to go back to the 50s where it's just you know the three r's and other people want to take us into the future where we're we're you know walking through virtual worlds to learn things so it's it's a tricky one to know what the best strategy is i like your idea of a better normal that is incremental thinking where it's a little better each time we go out, and that's a good one. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure this group is qualified to be able to plan a strategy to bring the whole culture into, into the process. Although office hours is a serious uh, dent in the universe at this point. Chris Clark? I wanted to second the motion that uh, better normal is a brilliant way to talk about it. And um, I've had success in the past with urging people who are trying to change everything to think more in terms of what would would make your your teaching situation more effective by 7% mm -hmm. and make that your annual goal what what could you stop doing mm -hmm. or begin to do begin to get better at that would move the ball about that 7% further. yeah and nope. and then repeat that the next year and so forth. So it is incremental, which can be frustrating to some, mm -hmm. but it can be reassuring to others. So mm -hmm. I offer that as a, a footnote to the better normal. Sure. All right, our next idea. Our next idea comes to us from John Snyder. When to use video, how to plan video, and how to film video. Okay. We'll start with you, Aaron, and go to John after. I think this is great. I think this would be a great topic to really focus on because sometimes videos are just time fillers and they shouldn't be that. They should be something that's actually helpful for both the teacher and the student. Mm -hmm. And a better planned video is a better viewed video. Yes. John? Based on our conversation earlier about the constraints to video and why it's set in concrete when you do it, uh, that's something that I avoid video and I'd like to get better at it this year. All right. Well, I'll try and lead the charge there. Um, there was an item uh, that John and I had on our calendar for the future, which was uh, sort of the 11 steps to making a good video, which is something I can talk about quite a bit. And I've had to educate a lot of educators about where video fits and how to make a good one. Uh, Jesse? I think there's a lot to be said about how to, um, how to creatively integrate a, a more versatile video into a keynote workflow. So the, the big problem with video, like we keep saying, is that it locks you into the video that you have. But uh, planning your video for a, a different media platform than just playback with, uh, you know, dynamic uh, titles, things like that that can change and grow over time could be an interesting second hour. 
There's also the idea that some of these editing tools uh, and output tools are more automated and getting better and easier to use. And that uh, in some respects, the skills you learn making your first video make it easier to make your second. But also, if you keep all your material next term or next year, uh, you revise your video and update it. And as you say, change some of the titles or, or shorten some segments that you know bored everybody. And over time, your stuff is always fresh. So that's another idea. Let's have our last idea. And our last idea comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How can we leverage ultra-fast broadband technology, fiber to the premises, for example, to bring the educational environment more deeply into the home? John Snyder. Might be interesting to pair this with how do you leverage ultra slow internet? So how do you handle, you know, kind of both sides of that coin? Yes, fiber to the premises is the dream, isn't it? All of us having fiber to the door or the sidewalk, and then we're all going to be super connected and it's all going to get easier. Broadband and mobile kind of emerge both at the same time. And uh, we're now at a point where, you know, broadband is is starting to get more dense and, and more people have it. Um, how can we leverage that is always the dream. Uh, any new pathway into the home is going to include trying to enhance education. So we will be interested in that. And it'll probably be a side discussion to any of the subjects that we've been given today, that the broadband is a factor in the delivery of those things. Jesse? I think that question opens up a, a bigger ethical question that I, I imagine needs to be discussed forever till the end of time. And that, that question is kind of an, another way to ask it is, uh, how do we make the kids with the best experience have an even better experience? And uh, it's, it's an interesting and fun one to play with. But there's another question, the inverse of that question, uh, that I think is much more important. Thanks. There is, of course, a, you know, cultural divide sometimes with access to internet. So we'd have to take into consideration the benefits might go to a few and not to the many. But that's a philosophical one rather than a um, instructional or technological one. All right. Thanks to everybody. A big thank you goes out to all the people who submitted the ideas today. And you're the community who make Education Hour possible. We'd also like to acknowledge all the committed people who volunteer every day to operate office hours and after hours for all of us. We'd also like to thank today's panelists for providing valuable insight into today's brainstorming session. Join us again next week. Uh, I believe John Snyder will have something going on next week. Uh, oh, my, hold on. I've got to think about that. It's probably me. It's probably me next week. I'm going to do something next week. There's always people in after hours all day and uh, all night. So they're ready to lend a hand with any kind of online issues you might have. And after hours can get a quick answer to you most of the time to nearly any technological question you might have. Thanks for being with us today and we'll see you next Saturday. Only seven minutes over. As usual, we had a flurry at the end there. Our sheet for scale.